Classic of Difficulties. Greetings and welcome to Classic of Difficulties, Difficult Questions in Medicine, Acupuncture, and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. James Mohabali. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, and I will be your armchair philosopher in residence and your tour guide as we try to ask some difficult questions about medicine, health, alternative medicine, and maybe the meaning of life. My goal in this podcast is that by asking and unpacking these tough questions, we will maybe leave with a couple of answers, but we will definitely leave with more questions than we had at the start. This is episode four, What Does the Heart Do? Part one, the heart is not a pump. You might have heard us talking about this hot button issue on Watar. That's why are we talking about rabbits? a podcast by my good friend John Hears and First Things Foundation, which is a very cool nonprofit organization. If you didn't hear us there, go check it out after this episode. Link is in the notes below. In that discussion, we thrust you into the very strange and very new idea, or perhaps the very old idea, that the heart might not be a pump. That's right. The organ in your chest that all that blood moves through in order to get to the whole body Our claim in that episode, and today, is that it is not what you think it is. Or at least, it's not what medicine and modern science tell you it is. It might be a whole lot more like what your experience as a human being tells you about your heart. So right away, you might be asking yourself, well, what does the heart do then? And if it's not a pump, then how does the blood move, Mr. Smarty Pants? And How come everyone else keeps telling me that the heart is a pump? And why are we even talking about this, since it doesn't really seem like it matters that much? Before we get into all of those very, very important questions, I need to give credit where credit is due. Just like the famous quote from Isaac Newton, we are standing on the shoulders of giants here. We would not be able to have this discussion without some very important and some very smart people, and also some very controversial people. First, we have to thank Jeffrey Yuen, who is my teacher, and who is a pretty cool guy, and I highly recommend looking into him. But we also have to thank Rudolf Steiner, Dr. Thomas Cowan, who also has a podcast, check him out, and Branko First, and Victor Schauberger, and last but not least, a friend of mine, Taylor Nelson, who is a big fan of all things Vortex and who without him, I would not be as passionate as I am about vortexes. And of course, we have to thank the ancient Chinese classics, mostly the Huangdi Neijing and the uh, the Huangdi Neijing Su Wen and the Huangdi Neijing Ling Shu. So what does the heart do? Well, first, let's ask ourselves why we think it's a pump and how that pump might work in order to move blood. So the heart is this muscular organ in the chest, and it has four chambers. Two on the right and two on the left. On the top right chamber, there's a squishy-sided, thin-walled giant vein called the vena cava that dumps a bunch of blood into there. Then between the, the right two chambers, there's a valve that the blood passes as it moves into the lower right chamber, the right ventricle. There's a diagram of this in the show notes. This ventricle is pretty small compared to the left ventricle, just so you know. That'll be very important later, that the right and the left ventricle have very different sizes. From the right ventricle, blood moves into the lungs, and then comes back into the left side of the heart, namely the left atrium, which is on top. It passes another valve into the left ventricle, which is the hugest and strongest part of the heart. And then from the left ventricle, it leaves into the huge, thick-walled aorta, specifically leaving through the aortic arch, which is a massive hairpin turn that the blood takes as soon as it leaves the heart. Remember the aortic arch and this hairpin turn, because it'll be important later. The aorta breaks up into smaller and smaller arteries and smaller arterioles, until finally the tubes, the capillaries, are one blood cell wide, and it's like a tight squeeze too, and these capillaries are totally invisible to the naked eye. In these capillaries, the blood literally comes to a stop. It even goes backwards a little bit, so that all of those good bits that the blood has in it, oxygen, food, whatever, all of that stuff can dissolve into the areas around the capillaries and then nourish those cells. And then what? 
well, we have a bunch of stopped blood in these capillaries. Well, somehow or another, the blood starts its way back to the heart, and it works its way into larger and larger veins, and all these veins are heading upwards, mostly towards the heart. Brain blood has the interesting feature of going downwards in its venous circulation. And then eventually, they all merge into the vena cava that dumps back into the heart. That all sounds pretty familiar, especially to those of you that might have taken an introductory anatomy class. Of course, this narrative that we are all so familiar with actually leaves a lot of questions. Let's start with the most obvious question. How does the blood start moving back to the heart once it has come to a stop? And let me mention now that the blood returns to the heart at the exact same speed that it leaves the heart. So whatever system we come up with here, it better be pretty good. That is, our system of returning the blood has to be as good and as strong as the heart pump itself. Now imagine, you have a bunch of sticky balls that are about the same diameter as the hose you're working with, and you're holding both ends of the hose. The hose goes to the floor, and as you drop the balls into the hose, they all collect at the bottom. I have been having a lot of bubble tea lately, so you can imagine it like little tapioca bobas if you want. By the way, if you haven't had bubble tea, you should try it. It's just like tea with cream and sugar, but there's stuff in it. And the stuff is these big, silly, round, chewy balls. It doesn't sound that awesome, but it is that awesome. Try it. Okay, so there's a bunch of boba at the bottom of the hose, which is like our feet. As you shove another boba down there, you might slowly push the first one, like, up half an inch or something. But basically, without something else going on, you're just going to have a bunch of boba trapped in your feet. We found out from detailed dissection that these veins, they happen to have one-way valves. So once the boba makes it up an inch, the valve traps the boba so that it can't go backwards. This secures our progress a little bit. You can imagine that if you just keep shoving more and more boba, you might get a steady but very slow stream of boba coming back to the heart. And the pressure of all that boba in the arteries, where you keep shoving in more and more boba, that's going to have to get really, really high since it has to shove all that inert boba on the other side. So since we don't want our artery boba straws to explode, let's add some extra oomph on the other side. Modern thinking says that as the calf muscles work, like with walking and stuff, they squeeze the veins, and that gives the boba an extra push upwards. So you would expect that if we stop using our calf muscles, like if we lay in a hospital bed for a while, or if we take an airplane flight across half the world, or if you're a paraplegic in a wheelchair, then your legs will swell up with boba. And they do. They get a little fatter. But like, how much fatter? Well, remember what it looks like without any leg squeezing at all. We're just shooting sticky balls at the ground and hoping that they push one another back up. So if we stop moving our legs, we would expect a huge amount of swelling. As Dr. Cowan says, we would expect that your legs would just keep swelling and swelling and swelling until they finally pop and you start flying backwards across the room. But we don't see that, not even in paraplegics. We see a moderate amount of swelling. So we're starting to see that there's some unanswered questions about the venous return. So now I'm going to say it again. The blood coming to the heart through the venous system that blood is moving at the exact same speed as the blood leaving the heart. So somehow, between the endlessly stacking boba and the calf muscles, we manage to get the blood moving as fast as the arterial circulation, which has to shove the boba stack at high pressure in the first place. And again, following on Dr. Cowan, we have to ask, what kind of idiot would put a pump in the place where the water is already moving the fastest? And what kind of stupid pump doesn't accelerate the water at all, but leaves it at exactly the same speed it comes in? Common sense dictates that first, you should put a pump where the water is slowest, not where it's already moving at top speed. And second, you should put a pump at the bottom of the hill, not the top. So even if we're ignoring the arms and legs, the heart should obviously be in the pelvis, not the highest point of the torso, that is the chest. Third, if the heart isn't making the blood go any faster, then what exactly is it even doing with all that jumping around and lub-dubbing? And remember that aortic arch where all the blood of the body at top speed rushes around a hairpin turn as soon as it leaves the starting line? 
Well, it does something very strange when the heart pumps. Imagine holding a hose with a tight bend in it. This is again, borrowed from Dr. Cowan. And imagine turning on the hose full blast. What does the bend do? It straightens out. And then you turn off the water really quickly. The hose goes back to being bent. So what does the aortic arch do when the left ventricle is seen contracting? The aortic arch, it's not like that hose. It doesn't straighten out. The aortic arch actually does the opposite. It bends in tighter, making a sharper angle. So what does this mean? It means that the left ventricle isn't forcing blood into the aortic arch. It means that it's actually doing the opposite. It's creating suction. And all this about suction aside, what kind of idiot tries to run his irrigation system with a hairpin turn right at the beginning of his main water line? Another big issue is the lungs and their circulation. If we need this huge left ventricle to force the blood into all the tiny capillaries of the body, then how could the relatively tiny right ventricle possibly be adequate enough to get the blood through all the tiny capillaries of the lungs? The last big issue is simply the numbers. If you line up all the blood vessels of the body end to end, they wrap around the earth three times. Or if you put them side by side, they cover three football fields. Now the heart is about one pound, and it's about the size of your, your fist. Remember that later, because it's important for understanding the acupuncture channel theory of the heart. So you take a one pound pump with relatively thin walls. By the way, the heart muscle is actually thinnest at the apex of the heart, where it connects to the aorta. So it's thinnest where it supposedly shoves a highly pressurized stream of boba at maximum pressure into the giant boba straw that is supposedly strong enough to push on all the thousands and thousands and thousands of boba that are stuck at the bottom of the cup. So you've got a pump that weighs one pound, and you're expecting it to squirt sticky goo full of bobas across three football fields, or three times around the world. Here's the thing. The numbers just don't add up, and the theory just doesn't add up. Someone else, way long ago, had a similar problem with figuring out the numbers about the mainstream theory of the heart. It was the 1600s, and for about 1500 years, everybody thought that the liver was actually the main source of blood. They thought that it worked like a fountain, where it just kind of kept pouring out and oozing blood all over the whole body, so that all of the tissues got their nourishment, and everyone stayed happy. Why did they think this? It's because Galen said it. And who cares about Galen? Well, Galen was the imperial physician to Marcus Aurelius. All you philosophy buffs out there know Marcus Aurelius. He was probably one of the only philosophers that can also claim to have literally been the emperor of Rome. Like, the one emperor. Like, the guy who was completely in charge of everyone in the Roman Empire. So Galen was his doctor, and he also treated a bunch of gladiators, and who doesn't love gladiators? So here's the thing about the emperor, not just in Rome, but pretty much anywhere. Whatever the emperor says, it kind of goes, so you really don't disagree with him, or with his doctor for that matter. But then the Roman Empire ended, right? But they still believed Galen and everything he said. They just kind of accepted that whatever Galen said was 100% totally true. They did a similar thing with Aristotle, oddly enough. They even had a saying that meant, well, even he said it. He being either Galen or Aristotle. So it'd go something like this. The planets orbit around the Earth and move in perfect circles. Aristotle said so. Or, women are just empty vessels, and men are totally responsible for making babies. Aristotle said so. Or, go get me a sandwich. Aristotle said you have to. Aristotle told me I need extra mayo to. It's obviously a little hard for us modern folk to imagine having this much reliance on a historical figure. We won't even believe what our best friend tells us without Googling it first. So, who was the one daring guy who finally doubted Galen? And what exactly was his beef? Well, this guy's name was William Harvey. And he was the first person, in the West at least, to really suggest that the blood circulates. Why did he start to suspect something was wrong? Well, he looked at how fast blood was moving through the arteries, which, by the way, is pretty fast. And then he said that 
Well, if it's just squirting out of the liver that fast and it never returns back to the liver, then how much blood do we go through in a day? The answer was astronomical. Harvey calculated that if the heart beats a certain number of times per minute, and if at each beat two ounces of fluid are released, then in an hour, the body would have to create 540 pounds of blood. So in order to make that much blood out of food, as Galen's theory would have it, we would need to eat at least that much food per hour, if not more. And obviously we don't do this. So we need to find another explanation. So Harvey reasoned to himself, it just wouldn't be a very good system if we didn't figure out how to reuse the blood, and we just kept making new blood constantly. So Harvey looked around, and he found evidence that blood goes out from the heart and the arteries and comes back in the veins, just like we were talking about earlier. And he did all of this empirically, with cool little experiments and with vivisection, which, by the way, is dissection of a living animal. It's one of the best ways to study the blood circulation. So, like, it's still alive, and you cut open this animal without anesthesia, and then you have to cut open arteries and veins and stuff and see how the blood squirts out. Often, it's a pig. And since it's a pig, it squeals. So, the first order of business is usually cutting the nerve to its voice box. Which, um, by the way, Galen became very famous for doing, by the way. It was one of his tricks that he did in the public square. And then at the end, you either stitch the pig back up and hope it lives, or you just kill the pig. It's a pretty brutal process. But from this brutal process, and from Harvey's other much less brutal experiments, he came up with this model, and he made a bunch of cool little old-timey pictures with disembodied hands, wearing fancy little frilly gloves, and pushing on the external veins and arteries of a burly farmer that he happened to find. And... All of these diagrams are labeled and neat and delightfully clear. They're really spectacular. He didn't have a microscope, though, so he couldn't see the capillaries. So he had to make this massive leap of faith. He said, I see the blood going one way, and I see the blood coming back the other way, but I don't see how the blood gets from the arteries to the veins. He happened to be right, but he definitely could have been wrong. It was a good guess, really. And here's the thing. Harvey mapped everything out, saying that the blood circulated. But he didn't say why the blood circulated, because saying why, well, that's not really the purview of the empirical scientist. He just wanted to know how things move the way they did. The question of why, if we can even get to that, comes much, much later. So Harvey mapped it out. Sometimes he said that the blood moved itself. Sometimes he said that the heart had something to do with it. He definitely did not espouse a theory that the heart is a pump and squeezes the blood like we describe it today. So the question becomes, who said that it does that? Well, the first guy is really Descartes. Good old Descartes. Poster child of the Enlightenment. I think, therefore I am. The guy who really just wanted to be a disembodied brain, floating in a vat of jello so that he could endlessly think forever and ever and ever. In his Discourse on Method, which is a short, tight little book written in French, not Latin, which, by the way, is super revolutionary at the time to write something in the common language, in one of the later chapters, he says, You know who's doing a really great job right now? My contemporary, William Harvey. He's just being such a good empiricist and figuring out how to throw out traditional old knowledge by doing specific experiments carefully. He's a guy who's really using his brain right now. And me, being Descartes, I want to see people using their brains. That way, we can all end up living in a giant tub of jello. So Descartes, he didn't want any kind of vital force in the picture. He wanted a mechanical universe that would obey mechanical laws. Ultimately, Descartes really wanted God and spirituality and anything spooky to be relegated to the back seat. And he wanted thinking to take center stage. Because the phrase, I think, therefore I am, means that the only thing that I can be sure of is my own thinking, and through my own thinking, I am sure that I exist. Only from this knowledge that I exist does the knowledge of anything else originate. This includes God and knowledge of God. It comes secondary to the knowledge that I exist. 
So how does the knowledge of new things come to us? Well, thinking about stuff, of course. So it's a worldview that's definitionally egocentric, mind-centric, and totally abstracted from any kind of meaning or significance outside of the individual in his mind. So what does Descartes say about Harvey? He says that Harvey has outlined this magnificent idea that the heart doesn't deal with any of those vital principles that Galen talked about, any of that magic stuff of life, but that the heart just pumps the blood, like a mechanical pump, and that's all there is to it. No spirit, no soul, nothing but squeezing and squirting. And that's where we're at now. Unlike literally everything else in Western medicine and science, we haven't really changed what we think about the heart in 400 years which is really weird because we can barely agree on anything in science, let alone agree on anything for any amount of time, let alone 400 years. So either Descartes was really super right, or there's something amiss here. I know what you're thinking. This guy, he probably just hates Descartes. And you know what? This guy, he sounds like one of those conspiracy theorists. Well, Harvey himself was one of those conspiracy theorists. Let me clarify. When we talk about a conspiracy theory, here's what the definition actually means. A bunch of people get together, and they all think the same way, and they have a particular goal, and they're trying to get that goal accomplished. That's the conspiracy. The theory part comes from the people on the outside. They say, hey, I think you guys are missing something and that you might be leaving out or ignoring some important information. As to whether it's on purpose or not, that's a whole different discussion. So let me give an example. McDonald's sells hamburgers, among other things, and they like it best when people buy their hamburgers. Lots of them. So there's a bunch of people that work for McDonald's, and they all get paid by McDonald's to do their job well. So you know what McDonald's is? It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy to sell hamburgers. They're going to do everything they can, everything in their power, to sell those hamburgers because that's what their job is. And you know what pays the bills and pays for Ronald McDonald's kids to go to college and for all those tiny little hamburger kids too? Selling hamburgers. No one at McDonald's gets to feed their family, go on vacation, or lead a normal happy life unless somebody buys those hamburgers. Let's say Steve works at McDonald's. Maybe he doesn't even eat at the restaurants, but he works there in HQ, doing some kind of office job, like designing the graphics for ads. Then he watches Super Size Me, or he finds out that something in the hamburgers is, like, really bad for you and causes health issues. Does Steve quit his job because of this information? Realistically, probably not. Steve probably just keeps going to work, keeps not eating McDonald's, doesn't feed it to his wife or kids, and continues supporting the mission of McDonald's to sell as many hamburgers as possible. That means that Steve, he's part of the conspiracy. So what happens when we have this crazy theory that McDonald's wants to sell hamburgers, and that Steve is involved, and that he's up to something in that office building? Well, really, you'd be crazy to think otherwise. It's obvious to anyone that McDonald's wants to sell hamburgers. But then, what if we suggest that McDonald's knows that such and such an ingredient is harmful, but they're serving it in their restaurants anyways? Well, for some reason, even though it's almost the same theory, we don't believe that one. Why not? Well, it's because we think that this theory means that Steve is out to get us. And he's not. We already said that. Steve's a pretty good guy, and he just wants to go to the beach with his kids in the summer, he just wants to visit grandma around Christmas time, and live a happy, normal life. But Steve doesn't have to be a bad guy in order for him to be involved with the burger-selling conspiracy. He doesn't even have to like eating the burgers. So, do we think that all of those Galenic physicians that Harvey disproved were deliberately trying to conceal the fact that the blood circulated? No, we don't. Or maybe they were. I mean, it doesn't even really matter. The fact of the matter is, what they were saying just wasn't true. And do we believe that Harvey is now out to get us and lie to us? Absolutely not. Descartes might be, but not Harvey. And certainly not your average cardiologist. 
In fact, you'd probably be hard-pressed to find a doctor who became a doctor for any other reason than wanting to help patients. I mean, being willing to put up with the rigors and trials of medical school, residency, fellowship, and all the struggle and suffering there, you'd better have a pretty good reason to put up with all that. So, doctors most likely want to help patients, and they most likely want to do a good job, just like Steve. So, what is the conspiracy here? Well, as Dr. Cowan points out, the evidence for the efficacy of our current approach to cardiology, especially congestive heart failure, is very limited. Even though our current approach is very effective at resolving symptoms, and in many ways it's an absolute blessing in the acute heart attack patient, stents and coronary artery bypass surgeries don't tend to do as much as we hope they will, in particular in the prevention of future heart attacks. And medications that we prescribe, based on the pump theory, like diuretics and blood pressure medications, they tend to cause a lot of problems, and they often aren't terribly helpful at treating the root of the illness either. I mean, how many people do you know who can say, oh yeah, I used to have congestive heart failure, but now I don't anymore. They fixed it. So we have this giant establishment of cardiology with billions of dollars of research, creating tons and tons of jobs, putting Steve kids through college, all full of people that are trying their hardest to help other people, but they're just doing so with an incomplete picture. Well, what's the incentive for ignoring the evidence that the heart is a pump? It's obvious. McDonald's doesn't want to have to give up selling burgers just because it turns out that they're not the healthiest kind of food for you. Think of it even another way. The pharmaceutical industry in Western medicine really started in its current form after World War II. If we could assign a historical period whose ideology most lines up with the ideology of Western medicine, it would be 1950s America on to the present day. In large part, the current state of Western medicine is only made capable by the huge technological advancement that occurred during World War II. I'll give you an example. I like to rock climb. Sometimes I rock climb in climbing gyms, sometimes outside. But before World War II, all rock climbing was done with hemp ropes. If you fall on a hemp rope at high speed, it'll probably break. So rock climbing wasn't really a very good idea before World War II. But now, both in the climbing gym and outside, we have nylon dynamic ropes. These ropes, they don't break when you fall on them, which is a good thing when you're rock climbing. Nylon was invented as a result of the boom in synthetic materials during World War II, and it was used back then primarily for parachutes and aircraft stuff. So we ramped up production on nylon because we needed all this aircraft stuff and parachutes, and we were at war. So we built all these factories, we made these machines, we created these jobs, and then all of a sudden the war ended. So what do you do? Well, you use those same factories to make climbing ropes and nylon stockings, and all sorts of other things that characterize what we know as the modern world. We had the extra stuff, so we had to do something with it. The same ethic is present in China, and has been present for thousands of years. Soybeans. They're these huge, difficult-to-digest beans. But soybeans, they're an asset agriculturally. They help add nutrients back into the soil, soil that is depleted by farming other crops. China has a long history of experiencing, and in fact accidentally causing, ecological disasters, so they are very familiar with how important soybeans are. They have an overabundance of this product that they make because of how they structure their society and their industries. So what do they do? They make soy sauce, and fermented soybeans, and tofu, and all kinds of interesting and tasty soy products. They even process a few herbs in soybeans in order to turn them into their final medicinal product, like husho wu. All of this is not because they're looking for a meat substitute, per se, but because they have all these soybeans on hand and they need to do something with them. We do the same thing nowadays, but with our current technology, we extract all sorts of unusual things from soybeans, and we try to make food additives and plastics and everything out of them. It's the same motivations, the same behavior, just a different time period. So there's a conspiracy to use these soybeans. There's a conspiracy to use the products and tools that we have at our disposal. The conspiracy to make soy sauce is really the same shape as the conspiracy that we like to call Big Pharma. 
it's people making a practical decision about the resources that they have at their disposal. So that's the practical incentive to keep all of this going exactly the way it has been going, but there's also an ideological incentive. Up until recently, since Descartes, the Western world has pushed forward with an increasingly mechanized worldview. If you asked your average person on the street in Boston right now, and I used to live in Boston, if you ask them if there's some kind of higher spiritual power or higher spiritual reality, they would most likely laugh at you. Even when we make our very modern forays into the spiritual world, we tend to do so from a Cartesian framework. I think, therefore I am, the Cartesian saying, becomes, I do Zen meditation, therefore I am. I do yoga, therefore I am. By the way, one of Descartes' other famous works is called The Meditations. In fact, the whole word of meditation is actually taken from the Christian tradition, then co-opted by Descartes, and then co-opted again by more modern scholars of Eastern thought. One phrase for meditation in Chinese just literally means quiet sitting. Anyway, so we have this huge ideological framework that we would have to destroy and rebuild from the ground up if we wanted to change our idea about whether the heart is just a mechanical organ. It would be a huge undertaking. And to be honest, we don't know what will be left over when we're done breaking it down, which is scary. And we definitely don't know what we'll be able to build up afterwards, which is even scarier. Unfortunately, I think we do have to destroy it. Why? Well, the foundation of empirical science values one thing above all else. Empiricism, that is, experience. If you can experience a phenomena, you can learn something about it. And throughout the ages, and throughout different cultures, we have countless phrases and countless experiences of feeling things in your heart, of love being in our heart, and of divine truth coming through the heart. We also have this idea of heartbreak, of when we can't deal with things in our life the way they turned out, and it's too much for us. And then we have the experience of modern life. We have more biomedically defined heart disease than ever before, and the numbers don't seem to be slowing down considerably no matter what we do. With our dramatic, unparalleled advances in the care of acute heart attacks, we've seen an increase in chronic heart disease and everything that comes with it. And you know what? Our emotional and spiritual hearts are sick too. Especially during COVID, we just don't have the human connection that we've counted on for all of human history. We don't get to share good times with friends in the same way, and we certainly aren't having as much joy. Rates of depression, anxiety, mental illness, which are all considered to be diseases of the heart in Chinese medicine, these are all skyrocketing. So not only is our paradigm failing, But everything around us right now is crying out, asking for a better option. In order to heal ourselves, our society, and our bodies right now, we need to have a new theory of the heart and everything that comes with it. The evidence has accumulated, and it's time we take a good hard look at what we believe in to figure out whether it's just a case of believing Aristotle just because, or whether it's something we really want to stand behind. Steve might not want to quit his well-paying job at McDonald's if everything is going well, but what if his family starts to get sick from eating the burgers? And what if his kids won't stop eating them because they think that, well, if dad works there, then these burgers must be fine? So let's take a look at our figurative hamburgers, shall we? And let's take a look at the heart and cardiology. Hopefully, some of the questions that we asked today will get answered in the next two parts of this three-part series, What Does the Heart Do?, In the coming episodes, we're going to look at some of the modern research, some anthroposophic medicine, that's Rudolf Steiner's medicine, who, by the way, he was the guy behind Waldorf schools, and we are, of course, going to look at my favorite, Chinese medicine. The classical texts of Chinese medicine, they have a lot to say about the heart, so we have tons of material to cover. So let's take a look, get some answers, and definitely find some more questions. Because wouldn't it be a shame if we had all the answers? I mean, then the mystery would be over, right? Like, if we just figured out the heart completely, and we could totally explain love. Why even bother dating them? So, thank you. Thank you for listening. And we hope to see you next time on Classic of Difficulties for part two of this three-part series on the heart. As always, 
keep asking questions, and stay difficult. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classic of Difficulties. We hope that you enjoyed our explorations today, and we hope that you'll tune in next time for more difficult questions. If you have any topics you want us to cover, or any awesome health professional you know that you'd like to see us interview, we would love to meet them. So reach out and let us know. Please share this episode with your friends, your family, your co-workers, your enemies, and everyone in between. Your interaction and support helps us keep making the content that we love to make and that you love to listen to.